Welcome to the Restituted Orbis channel and thank you for joining me for our exploration of Kansas City, Paris of the Old World Plains. The beautiful Kansas City, located at the confluence of the Kansas and Missouri rivers on the western side of Missouri. A little known fact that many people overlook is that Kansas City actually has a greater population than St. Louis. A very beautiful city that is quite worthy of the title Paris of the Old World Plains. And yet there are many mysteries behind Kansas City that we're going to explore. We see where Kansas City is located, right in the geographic center of the United States, and the geographic intersection of many great railroads. And this is quite a consideration when we think about what the capital city of a pre-existing civilization may have been. Now, recent explorations, which I even heard on John Levi's channel, indicate that perhaps Winnipeg was one of the major capitals of the North American continent. And there's no reason that can't be true. But considering some of the cities that exist in the United States, we have to consider the fact that Kansas City being at the major intersection point of so many existing railroads certainly lends to its potential prominence as one of the great cities of the pre-existing civilization. Now, could it be possible that Kansas City was built on a pre-existing civilization or it was a quote-unquote founded city? Absolutely. And was it also a city that existed in previous eras that we theorize on this channel with the eras that preceded the civilization before? Well, looking at what our contemporary historical account gives us, this is what Kansas City looked like in 1855. We have the usual story that the Native Americans roamed the lands, and then it was controlled by the French, and then briefly the Spanish, and then back to the French. Then it was acquired by the United States and the Louisiana Purchase, and Lewis and Clark came by during their little expedition to the Pacific, and they said, hmm, this looks like a good place to build a fort. Well, after that, Missouri became a state in the 1820s, and then they slowly built it up, and at the time it was simply known as the town of Kansas, until for some reason it became the city of Kansas, although who knows if that has anything to do with population. Interesting conflicting accounts. This is also the area where the Mormons had settled, and they view Jackson County as a very charmed and religiously important area. In any event, there was a conflict called the Mormon War in 1838. Although casualty figures from that war are very difficult to come by, we only know that there were 22 who died, and it says unknown civilian dead and wounded. So I guess it's not a very well-documented conflict. But just because something's not well-documented, at least we have an account that it happened. Yes, this is Father Donnelly, priest, mason, engineer, historian. He was from Ireland, but he was one of the, well, perhaps you could call him the first great citizen of Kansas City, as he led efforts to pave the streets and clear out these incredible mounds and hills that overlooked the Missouri River on the north side of Kansas City. These photos are very interesting, and they're supposedly from 1860 to 1880, when Father Donnelly brought in many Irish workers to clear out this area. This is another interesting photo, supposedly from 1870, that shows a levee. Although, maybe somebody in the comments would like to point out to me where they actually see a levee in this photo. Very bizarre, and this is quite reminiscent of the photos that we saw when we looked at Seattle. So what's exactly the situation here? Did they just decide to plant this city in very difficult terrain and not locate it just slightly down the river? If you go a little ways east on the Missouri River, you've got some nice flat terrain. Who knows what the real situation was, but it gives the indication that there was something that was already existing there that they decided that they were going to work through, especially when you see photos like this. Now, are these photos real? Could they have been altered? Could there be some other story behind them? Absolutely. Regardless, though, they are as part of the official archives, and they do paint a very different picture of what was actually happening in Kansas City in the 19th century. As always, I leave it up to you. Perhaps you believe that it is well documented enough and that this story, even if it doesn't make sense logistically, is sensible and it holds up for how Kansas City got its start. I was completely unaware, though, that there was this massive effort to clear out and do this kind of landscaping excavation project just to enable the downtown of Kansas City to be built. Much as I was unaware about the same thing with Seattle, and yet they even call these large areas canyons, I'm not exactly sure what to make of it, and perhaps it tells a different story as to what was actually going on in Kansas City in this time. Perhaps really what they were doing was that they were digging out what really remained and what had to be found. Or perhaps it really is, as the historical account gives us, that Father Donnelly was a genius, a jack-of-all-trades, and it would be easier to say what his talents weren't than what they were. 
However, there are many pictures from many decades that show that there were large bluffs. So it's very difficult to ascertain exactly what was happening. But it provides many different clues, and again, it presents many conflicting accounts. And then we look at the bird's eye map of Kansas City from the 1870s, and we see that it's already grown from the earlier one that we saw from the 1860s, supposedly. Very well-defined grid pattern, which it continues to have to this day. And you can even see the downtown where it runs up to the Missouri River. And you see a very interesting turning bridge as well there. Very intriguing. I suppose it would make sense to allow the riverboat traffic to get through there. We also see, though, that it seems to have a very well-developed infrastructure, even for this early time. We see many massive buildings and structures that have already been completed. And, of course, we'll be told that this was due to the efforts of the early settlers and Father Donnelly and the efforts of the Irish settlers. I wonder if somebody in the comments section is going to tell me that there was some great Irish person who only has one name that built their house that they still live in in Kansas City to this day. I look forward to reading that in the comments to do it today. Well, look at that with that turning bridge. Wonderful technology and certainly a remarkable engineering achievement for that time. Here's a picture of that bridge. Now, what exactly is this telling us? You can see some of the stone on it. Once again, the stone looks like it's a little older than perhaps it should be, but we'll just explain that away by saying it's the architectural process of rustication. Although, I've been fascinated by how many times that term is used. Other early pictures of Kansas City do sort of give the idea that it was the classic frontier town or the western city that we like to think of when we think of our mythical view of the American West. And yet we see other conflicting aspects in these pictures, many of these structures being made of brick if you look closely. Or perhaps they're made of some other substance that merely resembles brick. Not sure, but you know, again, the dating on these photos is always open to question. And here's the Kansas City Stockyards, Kansas City being in the very middle of the American Midwest and being a major intersection point for the compilation and processing of cattle. In fact, this was the second largest stockyard next to Chicago, which was quite legendary. Quite an impressive compound and extremely large with many different structures to it. And if you should ever have the pleasure of dining in 801 Chop House in Kansas City in the Power and Light District, they still have a great picture of this that's posted up there. Very interesting views, though, of the city because we go from that to suddenly having very advanced buildings and, of course, our electric trolleys. And these ones don't appear to be being pulled by horses, although the road looks awfully muddy there. So, once again, perhaps Father Donnelly and his crew didn't get around to that. And then we go a little later and we still see a little bit of a mix of some of the very advanced buildings, like that dome over there. And we see early automobiles. So what's really going on in Kansas City? Well, we seem to have many different accounts, and we also have accounts of many floods that seem to change things around and require a new train station to be built and different buildings to be torn down and rebuilt, and of course our usual story. It seems that every single city in the United States has gone through either a flood, a fire, a tornado, or some combination of these unfortunate disasters. This is an early photo, and you can see the Power and Light building there, a building that we have the pleasure of exploring today as it's still with us. Of course, we'll be told that it's an Art Deco building. Here's the earlier Union Station in Kansas City, not located at the same location as the present Union Station, which is quite an impressive structure. But looking at this old one, we still see it's an impressive structure. And look at all the power line poles there. Ah, yes, here is the individual, I'll be told, who built their house. The legendary Irish man named O'Brien. He has no other name, and I'm sure he built someone's house on the hill. And they'll be telling me all about it in the comments. And here is a picture of the current Union Station in Kansas City. Supposedly built in four years, 1910 to 1914. And it's something I've looked at before on one of the earliest videos on the channel. But I thought it fitting to go back there and explore it in person. And today you'll find that the interstate system, which ties Kansas City to the surrounding cities and allows you easy access to it, allows many beautiful views of an incredible landscape. And you can see that this city is built up on a hill and has a very prominent view. Looking at its impressive skyline to this day, though, we can see that many old world buildings have survived to this day. Although many people argue are these actually old world buildings. Well, the city hall, the county courthouse, which just happen to be located right next to each other. We'll be taking a closer look at those. That's what will greet you as you come into the city and you wander around the power and light district. 
Now, it should be noted that I decided to go conduct my on-the-ground exploration of Kansas City on the hottest days of the year because I'm dedicated. And not to mention that Kansas City is just a fun place to walk around. Add text. Yes. And there's my little joke there because you have all these little Art Deco buildings that are located so close to each other. You have a city hall located next to a county courthouse. That's the city hall. On the right's the county courthouse. And you can see that there's no shortage of beautiful architecture. Well, let's start with the New England building, constructed in 1886. And we see the hallmarks of the beautiful architecture, the finest of what will be told by the official historical account of the 19th century, with all the beautiful decorations. And I always love it when they have those protruding corner areas off the building. We'll see other fine stones and beautiful decorations, as though there was no limitation in labor or the ability to decorate and of course we'll be told that there were many fine craftsmen who were just wandering the lands and of course you had priests who were talented in everything from being architects to stonemasons to being able to pave streets oh and they were also mathematicians and brilliant historians yes all these things are told to us about the wonderful father bernard donnelly and i don't mean to discredit him but that's very interesting you look closely at some of these blocks and you see how large they really are and you have to consider the challenges that whoever really built this went through when they constructed it. And everywhere you look in this city, you see beautiful architecture. There is no shortage of it. You just walk anywhere in the downtown and you'll see that there is a lot of old world architecture that survives. Beautiful and unfiltered. And looking up at this beautiful building, just incredible. I always love looking at these little corner towers that protrude like this. The New York Life Building, built in 1890, and here we see another very large block building, whether it's sandstone, limestone, we'll be told many different materials for the composition, but very impressive with the columns down there by the very large door and an archway, and I really enjoy that uh, eagle motif there, very beautiful. And what exactly was the original function or purpose behind this building? We can only speculate. However, it stands today, it's very beautiful, and it seems to be doing quite well. That's certainly not something that you see, though, in many buildings, an eagle statue like that that's just overlooking the doorway. And, of course, we have our windows that look like they were built right in the ground. But anywhere you look, you're going to see any kind of neat architecture in Kansas City, whether you're looking at what's titled as the fire department, interesting with the pediment and these columns here. I'm also impressed by the scale of it. Well, they're not going to have any issues with anything happening to their fire department building, that's for sure. But wherever you look in Kansas City, you'll see this kind of architecture in these beautiful old world buildings. It's very impressive. And again, we see the same thing here with the columns and the very large blocks. And even over here on this church with what appears to be a gold-plated tower. I'm reminded of the Iowa State Capitol once again. And this financial holding corporation building, whatever you really want to call it, with the many columns. These do not look sectional. And then, of course, that decorative motif up there by the roof. I also noticed there were some areas where they were doing some construction. You can kind of see some of the older pieces of the city. I always find these little areas with this excavation interesting to look at because perhaps there's some clues to be found. Well, now we go to the Power and Light Building in 1931. And apparently Kansas City did not seem to suffer the effects of the Great Depression, or they made the most of it, because we're going to find out that they built a slew of beautiful Art Deco buildings during the height of the Great Depression, no less. So a good two years after the stock market crash, and they managed to throw up this beauty. And this is definitely one of the most beautiful Art Deco buildings I've seen on the exterior. Stepping back from it a little bit, uh, we saw that it had that very unique tower top to it. And we'll take a closer look at that as well. But right now, I just want to focus on some of the decorations on the side of it. And there you can see the tower with the little sun motif on the top of it. All the trimmings of the classic Art Deco building. But then decorated all the way from the bottom to the top floor. It's very intriguing whenever you consider these Art Deco buildings and all the effort that they clearly committed in terms of whoever actually built them, because again, the Art Deco buildings I always find very questionable. I find the year very questionable. And this is one of the main decorations that you're going to see on the Power and Light building. Very impressive and very beautiful. And usually what we'll see with some buildings that they'll tell us are Art Deco, but really aren't Art Deco, is they tend to lack these beautiful decorations. 
I could not find the exact name of this building that's right next to the power and light building, but it's just as beautiful with many of the decorative touches. Not exactly sure what year we're going to be told this was built, but look at this with all the little pediments there above the windows and some of the decorations on the roof line, and then even some of the symbols up there. So it continues that wherever you look in Kansas City, you're going to see amazing things, such as B&B theaters constructed in 1924. And look at the dome on this with the portal windows. And we've seen those patterns before in other cities that we've looked at that we see in the windows. Very impressive architecture and very beautiful for a theater that was built in the 1920s. Although I suppose it's a little more sensible that something like this was constru constructed in the 1920s when it was the Roaring Twenties, or at least the economy, so we're told by the official historical account, was doing well in the United States. And again, you see little decorations on the side of it. Now walking back down to the west, the Municipal Auditorium built in 1935, again during the height of the so-called Great Depression. Maybe they just should have called it the Great Building Boom in Kansas City. Hmm, interesting symbol. Why does that look familiar? And then we see that they decided to put a couple other symbols on this building because, again, it being the Great Depression, and there was no issue just finding labor and having money to bring in these very giant blocks. Again, I have to ask the question in terms of what kind of material this really is. Is this some sort of concrete? Is this Portland cement? Something about this, again, gives the clue that this is much more enduring cement. And for some reason, I'm once again reminded of Roman concrete. The Jackson County Courthouse, constructed in 1934. Another building built during the Great Depression, and it features a nice statue of Andrew Jackson in front of it. This isn't a county courthouse. This is a county court building extravaganza. And look at the beautiful artwork on the front of this building. Look at these reliefs. Very impressive and very beautiful. Now, while I was actually standing there admiring all this beautiful architecture, it looked like there was a little bit of a property auction going on in the front, but few people attended. This is the previous courthouse in Kansas City, and the one before this was destroyed by a tornado, I suppose not too surprising. But as you can see in this image, it's a very impressive structure itself. So I guess they felt they had to throw up an Art Deco building, and it had to be utterly extravagant. I even like the little tower rook piece there. Look at the detailing above this very large doorway. It definitely gives you the feeling of stepping through a portal as though you're going into some other sort of world. And you see these incredible reliefs above it. And then going up the length of the building. Right across the street from it is the Kansas City City Hall, because why not put the City Hall next to the County Courthouse? And this was built 1935 to 1937, and we see many of the same hallmarks of the architecture. And once again, during the height of the Great Depression. Although they did manage to finish this, it seems, before the next economic downturn that hit the United States in 1937, but people tend not to talk about that. Franklin Roosevelt was very convincing in his fireside chats. Again, just another incredibly beautiful building with beautiful artistic work all over it as though they had infinite time and resources and during the great depression no less that they were able to establish this i even enjoy the way the steps go up to the top of it it's very intriguing to me though because in the cities that we've looked at so far i haven't exactly seen a county courthouse <laughs> and a city hall that have been located next to each other like this look at the artwork and the relief there's just something otherworldly about this now, if we really had the ability to do this in the 1930s, and we can't do this now, or we opt not to do this now, then how far have we truly fallen? And just for a little contrast, as I was leaving the area, I saw the Richard Bowling Federal Building, and I just wanted to show you uh, what kind of architecture we tend to go with today. Ah, yes, look at that beauty. We are the Borg. Lower your shields and surrender. Resistance is futile. I definitely get those feelings when I look at this building. Well, now Kansas City Union Station, finished in 1914, and probably one of the most impressive pieces of architecture in this entire city. One of the most grand Union Stations, and we consider the Union Station we looked at in St. Louis, and it was very impressive, a castle-like structure, and yet this is just a mammoth structure that defies simple explanation. This is a train station that was built to replace an earlier train station, and look how incredibly beautiful it is. Look how large it is. And then even all around it, you see other very beautiful structures. And eventually, Liberty Memorial, or the National World War I Memorial, as it's called now. And we see the history behind Union Station in Kansas City. And of course, it was the flood in 1903 that they refer to. And now they talk about how they've commemorated it. 
and you can see that it's standing up quite well and it's also very incredibly large looking down though I see a little bit of a different concrete though in the floors that appear to be below the ground and that's very interesting and then studying the rest of the building and of course we have our usual pediments and our decorations and just appreciating the massive size but it's when you go inside this building that you're completely blown away why do you need to have ceilings that are 90 to 110 feet high and look at the beautiful decorations on the ceilings and the walls and the large blocks 1910 to 1914 and then I don't want to forget the floor which has beautiful patterns on it and it appears to be an entirely hard surface whether it's made of granite or some other material that we can't properly identify because as I said looking at enough of these buildings up close and personal I've started to question all this I like this little clock here that goes down the main gallery and of course we have other beautiful symbols and motifs and the usual trademark of the very large pillars that are built into the wall this is all very incredibly impressive. Ah uh, yes, another one of those clocks that has four I's or four ones instead of the IV on it. And just to give you a better view of the beautiful floor, and this is the main gallery. I couldn't access all of it because there was a convention there, but it gives you an idea of how large it really was. This is where the people waited for their trains. And of course, you know, when you're waiting for a train, you need to have a ceiling that's over 100 feet high and well decorated. So you can look up and imagine that you're in a very large environment. I don't know, perhaps a lot of people were claustrophobic back then. They do have some plans setting up, in, setting up in Union Station, and it gives you the idea that, once again, perhaps this was recorded? I don't know. I mean, I guess you only need two perspectives to really be able to effectively design a building. I examined some of the blocks and noticed some of the construction behind them, and you can see some of the concrete is cracking. But it's very interesting that a lot of the concrete, or whatever this building is truly made of, is standing up very well. It's over 100 years old. Well, since it was 102 degrees that day, I decided it would be fun to just uh, skip up the stairs and go to the Liberty Memorial. Now, I call it the Liberty Memorial because that's what it was originally called, the giant tower that you see there in the distance, well over 200 feet tall and a very impressive structure in and of itself. The monument that was dedicated to the veterans of World War I in the United States. They supposedly completed it in 1926, although there's conflicting accounts on that, and you can find construction photos, but make of them what you will. I was still very impressed, though, by the structure, and since the temperature being what it was, I pretty much had the entire structure to myself. Ah, uh, yes, the IRS Tax Center. Beautiful building with some great pillars in it. I'm not going to bother looking up uh, what the stated date on that is because, well, let's just say I question it, even if it's well documented. Look at this beautiful relief, though, here on the front of the Liberty Memorial. Very interesting and very intriguing with the detail that you see behind this. And once again, I mean, I see some figures that look like they could be soldiers from World War I, but we see a lot of other questioning figures on that. Interesting relief. Ascending the stairs, you go up onto the main memorial itself and you see the great giant tower. And I'm not sure how many stairs I climbed at this point, but I made it. And we have a couple sphinxes that have wings over their eyes because apparently they're covering their eyes from the terror of the war to end all wars. And we saw how accurate that was. And then, of course, you have the main tower, which is in the center. Now, it should be noted that underneath this tower is where the actual World War I museum is located. Yes, as though they added that as an afterthought. And it should be noted that this was funded by local prominent citizens in Kansas City, and then, of course, from donations. And you see you have a great view of Union Station and the downtown of Kansas City. And this just gives you an idea of how large Union Station is, as you can see the vehicles parked near it. And there on the left, you can see the power and light building that we looked at earlier. You can see the county courthouse and the city hall. <laughs> and some other very impressive buildings that continue with us today. And of course, they've surrounded them by the beautiful postmodern brutalist buildings that we prefer today. Looking up at this tower, though, you can see one of the giant guardian figures. Well... At least we know Kansas City would never rename their sports team to a Guardian. This is a mystery building that I found near the Arts Center, and there'll be a special members video that's going to cover what this building's all about. We see a couple signs of old world architecture, but there's actually a lot more behind this building. It's a very intriguing story, and it certainly reinforces the narrative that someone might be trying to mislead us on our explorations, and I can't imagine why anybody would do that. And now we look at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, built in 1933. 
Yet another incredibly beautiful building that was built during the Great Depression. And of course, we're told that it's from the generous efforts of a couple real estate developers in Kansas City, Nelson, a gentleman, and Atkins, a lady, who decided to devote their funds to build this incredibly beautiful gallery of art, which, of course, has columns, and on the inside, you find that it's an even more beautiful building. Marble columns, which I checked and confirmed that these are all marble, at least what we think of as marble. Very beautiful floor and beautiful skylights. Now, I find it fascinating that this building is filled with beautiful artwork, because it's almost as though you come there to see the artwork and you'll miss the architecture if you're not really paying attention to it. And I look and I see all this incredibly beautiful architecture and art mixed on the inside of this building. Very impressive entryway too. When you look at the roof and the walls, it's unbelievably beautiful and it's almost as though you're going into some kind of old church. And yet this was supposedly built in the 1930s. And look at some of the beautiful detail here on the entryway by this very large door. Once again, I mean, I understand that this is supposedly an art gallery, but we were building this in Kansas City at the same time we were building all these other buildings. I went in and looked at some of the paintings because I was impressed by what I saw. And once again, it's almost as though you have a different technique with the painting. They seem so lifelike with the faces and the depictions. And this is the... August the Strong, Elector of Saxony. And I looked at some of these other paintings, and while they're supposedly from the 18th century, we see ruins in them. A little pyramid there with the pediment and some columns on it. And then over here in this painting, more ruins. So very intriguing that they're depicting ruins, and then some large structure there in the background. And of course, when you look up what these paintings are really about and what they're depicting, they'll always give you some explanation. But again, I wonder if this is just something where we just write something down and then people who like to say, well, it's very well documented, so I'm just going to believe what I'm told and that's good enough for me. Even if, you know, one county's well-documented history completely conflicts with another county's well-documented history, I'm sure somebody got it right. Isn't this intriguing here? Very, very beautiful, and another painting depicting what appear to be very advanced building construction techniques with many arches, a beautiful clock, and of course, no shortage of columns. And I suppose you can explain this away. Look at that building there onto the left. And what's the detail behind this one? The clock tower in the Piazza San Marco, 1728. And, you know, it wouldn't be a complete set of paintings to look at unless we found a couple domes with some beautiful towers on them and some very ornate architecture. I'm going to guess this is Venice, but I could be wrong. Very beautiful. And once again, someone to be seeing this and painting it is quite incredible to me. Ah, uh, yes. And then looking at some other paintings, you can see the same details. A little structure in the background there. But then also pulling out, I just wanted to show you that this is a painting that's on a wall here in the art gallery. Just surrounded by marble. So, I'm beginning to wonder exactly what's the original purpose and intention of this building. I mean, we can accept that it was built in the 1930s and that all these incredible works of art just happened to end up on it. But I'd like to hear your comments and your opinions on what you think this is. Look at how beautiful this entryway is. Well, I'll close out with the Kansas City Country Club Plaza, supposedly built in the 1920s, opened in 1924, 1925, depending what account you look at. And you have some very beautiful structures that are supposedly reminiscent of wonderful structures in Spain. As though, once again, the 1920s, well, again, at least we were in an economic boom, the Roaring Twenties, you can see some of this beautiful architecture in Kansas City. And it's quite incredible when you look at the little details on this. And this was just supposed to be an imitation architecture, yet this is coming up on 100 years old, and it's still holding up this well. The Country Club Plaza, a very beautiful place to visit, and of course what Kansas City will tell you it's for is for shopping. They just happen to throw some beautiful architecture up in it because, you know, they had nothing better to do with their time. And this is where Kansas City got the title of City of the Fountains because this is where you'll find many of the beautiful fountains as well. So once again, more conflicting accounts, and yet many beautiful towers, beautiful buildings with beautiful decoration on it, all to build a shopping center. I mean, oh yeah, look at that little face up there. Isn't that very intriguing? I don't even like the little beard and the mustache, so what's that really depicting? Everywhere you look, ah uh, yes, we have another little dome here. And a very well-developed tower on that. 
There's just nowhere you can go in Kansas City without seeing incredible beauty and what appears to be vast, copious amounts of old world architecture everywhere you look that defies simple explanation. And I'll be honest, despite the fact that it was over 100 degrees, I enjoyed every minute that I was in Kansas City just to be able to see these incredible, beautiful works of art and these beautiful buildings. However, there was just one slight issue with Kansas City. Well, thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.